For Creamer Media's Policy, I'm Sashni Wadi. Dindiwe Hani joins me to discuss her book, Being Chris Hani's Daughter. This month marked 24 years since the death of your father, Chris Hani. Tell us about the type of person your father was and how you viewed him as his daughter at a time when many revered him. Mm, well, you know, my dad, I don't know, you know, like I'm always tempted to say he was a normal father, but I think that that would be understating it because fathers are so different. But he was very attentive. You know, what I, what I loved about him is that he got three girls, but, and, and he's an, he, was an, he was an African man. As one of three girls, mm -hmm. I never once felt that he wanted me to be a boy or he wanted us to be boys. And it was just the opposite. He was so proud to have girls and he used to tell us we can do anything we wanted to do. And I think that we took him to heart because even growing up, we were quite fearless. Mm -hmm. Like in terms of anything we tried, I was very outspoken. Um, he used to tell me that I talk too much. Um, um, he'll, he pities the man who will marry me <laughs> because I just have a lot to say. He was kind. He was funny. He was, he was a bit wacky. You know, he, was, he's had a, he had a sense of humor, like he had a dad humor, mm -hmm. you know, that could be embarrassing. We made a lot of fun of him. So yeah, he was, he was a great, he was a great person. And um, at the time when he was alive, it didn't, I didn't feel that I was Chris Honey's daughter. I mean, I would get glimpses about um, through interactions with other people, like when I attended rallies with him about how much he was loved, but it never impacted our family, you know. Once he walked into the house, he was just daddy and he was just free for all you know, low blows and everything, yeah. You initially wanted to write a book about your mother and her family, rather than one about yourself and your father. Why did you change your mind? I didn't decide to write, I did, yeah, I was going to say, I didn't decide to write about my father. Um, I decided to write about my life. And it was a cathartic process. I think I just wanted, you know, there was, a, there was actually a small part of me that still thought that this is like a dear diary moment mm -hmm. and nothing will be published, you know, even though I was writing it with Melinda Ferguson. Mm -hmm. it, was still, it was still meant to be for my eyes only, for me to get all the demons out, you know, and move on with my life. Um, so it was, it was important, that is an important part of my life, you know, even though it was 12 years, he had a huge impact in my life and he still continues to do so. So he, but we were very clear, and luckily I worked with Mel, who was so supportive of this idea that it's not about Chris Honey, it's not the Chris Honey story. Mm -hmm. And even in the book, I mean, we'd say, we give a background of who he is, for those who didn't know who he was, but we don't go into detail about his life. Mm -hmm. um, yes, you know, maybe I can still write one about my mom and her sisters, because they fascinate me, you know? I just, there's something about, women's stories that haven't been told, you know, that mm -hmm. just completely gets my imagination going. You write that while you didn't experience racism growing up in Lesotho, your family lived under constant threats, with your father mostly away in exile. Tell us a bit about your childhood, your relationship with your siblings and parents, as well as the daily bomb checks. Oh, yeah. Um, my, you know, Lesotho in the 80s was a very idyllic place. You know, it was, it was, it was just, full and vibrant and so many cultures so growing up I had friends from all over the world one of my closest friends was actually from Australia and we were very close and we used to go to each other's houses and have sleepovers so it was it was in that way that it felt like a it felt like a novel childhood you know the childhood you read about when you read about suburban America you know, riding bikes and playing until dusk and then running home and all those kind of things. And then my relationship with my, I was the last born, I am the last born. Um, so my eldest sister, Neo, who's nine years older than me, was always my protector, you know. And then the middle sister, Kwezi, who's now late, she was 18 to two years older. So it was a very close gap. So we fought, you know, it was, it could get very dirty, it could get um, intense, and then she would try, and then because she was older than me, she always had this vocab, mm -hmm. and then she would use long, big words, and then I'd be like, well, well, just shut up, you know, and then run off crying to my older sister, and my older sister would deal with her. So it was, it was, it was fun, it was great, it was, there was always, there was always activity in our home, you know, because someone would always have a friend over, or a relative would come over, and I had my mom's dad, um, also lived there, my mom's sister, 
So we were always around, surrounded by family, you know. I still, I still up to this day consider growing up in Lesotho one of my happiest moments in life, you know. And um, my dad, I talk to him every day. Well, it actually, I, you know, in my childlike mind, it felt like every day, but I'm sure it couldn't have been every day. But that's how big a presence he was in our lives. And we would talk, I would tell him about someone picked on me at school or crazy irritated me or mommy said this. So it was, he was a dad, you know, he didn't ever say, hurry up, hurry up, hurry, you know. Um, and my mom was a normal mom. She was a great homemaker. I always remember um, Sundays as would my, would my mom would go to church, then come back, then there'd be lunch. And then you can go play, but you know at 3 o'clock you have to be back because it's now hair time for the week. So you have to wash your hair, do your hair, and then Mama would be baking and the house would just be smelling of glorious food. And that's what I remember, yeah. And then um, just every morning, I remember my mom would go to the car and make a stand a distance from the car while she opened the bonnet. And only later, I never asked her when I was young, only later when I said, why did you do that? She said, no, your dad said that I must, ch I must pretend to know that I know what I'm looking for. Just in case people are watching, they won't, they won't put a bomb in the car because they think I know what I'm doing. So that's why she did it. But I never thought to ask when I was young. I thought, this mm -hmm. is what all families do. Yeah. After your father's death, you write that it was difficult to cope. You also faced three major tragedies following your father's death. An abortion and the deaths of your sister Kwezi and your boyfriend at the time. How then did you try to get through this time? I, I didn't. I didn't. I think I chose not to deal with it at all. I chose to self-medicate. I just chose to hide. I chose not to live in the reality. And, but the weird part is that when I would be drunk and high, I would cry. And that's the only time I would talk about it, you know? And I can tell you that is not fun for people, you know. Um, so I didn't deal with it. I, I actually did the opposite. I tried to run far and fast away as possible. Yeah. During years of using, you say that you avoided going to your father and sister's graves. Why? It, it, felt, it felt that I had let them down so badly. And not that, they were, not that I felt that they were judging me, but I just felt that I couldn't, you know, it's like when you know you've done and horrible things, it's difficult to look someone that you've, you've done that, that thing to in the eye. So as much as it sounds crazy, going to that grave for me was facing them. And I didn't want to face them because what would we talk about? What would I say to them? Where would I begin? So I just felt that I couldn't own up to my mistakes and I, I felt like I couldn't look them in the eye. So I just decided not, not to go. In one incident, you had been on a cocaine and alcohol binge and you had to be taken to hospital after blacking out. Why at that point did you decide you needed help? It wasn't immediately because at the hospital the next morning, the doctor came and said, listen, what are we going to do? Yeah. You know, are we going to go to rehab or what? I said, no, can you imagine? In, in my mind, I was just like, I've got this, you know? I know I have a pride, I knew I had a problem, but I was just like, don't worry, I can stop. It was just, you know, it feels like there were so many things, catalyst, catalysts happening at, in that space in my life. I wasn't ready, but at the same time, I think something dramatically changed. I can't tell you what it is, but I just know that that Saturday when I woke up, I was still high and drunk. I dropped my daughter at my mother's house and I continued to keep using and drinking that day. And then I was sitting there with my dealer and I was just like, this is my life. This is, this is, this is what's going to happen. I have nothing and no one. And then I just decided that I, I didn't want to live like this anymore. So I called my sister and I told her I need help because I just felt that I, I was going to continue you know, when you, I could feel, I could feel that I was going to die, you know, because I just was getting more and more and more out of control. And whereas before my daughter would have been a base to be like, binge, stop, binge, stop, now it was just consistently binging. So I just felt in my bones that I was going to die. And I, I thought of her and thought that if I die, she will grow up thinking she wasn't good enough. 
and then I saw the movie in my head of where she picks up drugs. Mm -hmm. And I just thought that we, I need to stop the cycle. Yeah. You write that your mother had given you a great childhood. Why and when did you begin to harbor negative feelings towards her? <laughs> well, not harbor. I think that being a teenager, I mean, I was on the precipice of being a teenager when Diddy died, and she had to go and work because she had to put food on the table. So she went off to become, she became a member of parliament, and, and she was gone for four days a week. Um, and I was 13. So in the, less, in the space of less than two years, I felt like I'd lost two parents. Mm -hmm. I had no anchor, you know, I was just floating. And that's when I first tried to kill myself. And I resented that I couldn't speak to her, you know, because it was almost like I felt like I'd be putting on more burden. So I, I think that's when I resented, I resented the fact that I felt like she wasn't there, but you know, it's, it's, it's easy to say people are not there when you don't ask for help. And I wasn't asking for help. And um, we always had not, not an acrimonious relationship, but the thing is we had fights. We had fights which I think are normal. And I think then she got worried. She saw my life spiraling, spiraling. And I think people were telling her, your daughter's on drugs, your daughter's on drugs. And she didn't know what to do, you know. And um, so she'd confront me on these things and then it would turn abuse it would turn abusive between the two of us screaming at each other um, so I think I think I don't know I would like to believe those are normal growing pains but also because I couldn't take care of myself she stepped in and did a lot of taking care of to the point where sometimes it felt like smothering you know so so I had to also take back my life. And I think it's difficult when someone has been helping you to such an extent to say, I'm okay now, yeah. give it back. And they're like, no, I don't want to, you know? So that's when I had to, where we set boundaries and it's getting healthier. We have a lot, our relationship right now is much healthier. What was your mother's reaction to your book and what is your relationship like today? Initially, she was very cautious because um, we are a very private family. You know, we don't, the only time I think you'd hear from my mother or myself is always on the 10th of April. But other than that, we don't talk to anyone, to the media. Um, so she was very cautious. But then when I, as the process went, and I kept on explaining to her what I'm talking about, then she was like, oh, okay, this is about you. You know, this is about your journey. And at the end of the, by the time I finished the book, she was the biggest cheerleader. She was like, oh, when is it launch? Here my name, here the, my friends' names, here, you know. So she was very proud. And she kept on saying, it's your journey. It's your story. You have to tell it the way you want to. Um, today, our relationship is a lot healthier. It's a lot healthier. Um, she's very, her and my daughter are like thick as thieves, you know. They, they, they spend a lot of time together um, and they're very close. And you know, like, um, we are learning, I think my mom and I are discovering each other in this new adult setting. So she's, she's incredibly supportive. She's incredibly loving. You know, she loves, my, she loves me, she loves my daughter. But it's also how to deal with this new Lindy. It's a new dynamic for her, you know, because I think instinct is to smother me. But she's, I love that she is respecting that I need to find my own two feet. And she's letting me do it, so that's great. You say in your book, I had grown up as the daughter of Chris Harney, and yet for as long as I could remember, I couldn't shake the sense that I was useless. Why did you feel this way? You know, that, that one is just, it's a bit difficult to explain. It's, here is this bigger than life legend. You know, he, you know, he, was, he was elevated to martyrdom, you know, martyr status. And there is no way you'll ever be as better or as good as someone like that. And I felt that people were always, and this is, that's why I like to say I felt, because of me feeling and reality are two different things, but it felt like people kept on expecting me to be him. And I always felt it, they, I, um, I fell short of it all the time. And it came to a point where why even bother, you know? I might as well be this useless drug addict 
than be anything because I never, I did never felt I'll be close to what my father was. So I never I wanted to aspire to greatness, you know. So, so that's why I always felt useless and worthless because of what I was doing to myself and because of what I, I perceived people thought about me. You decided to meet Clive W. Lewis, the man who was jailed for the assassination of your father. What was it like meeting him and his wife? And what was the reason he gave to you for killing your father? It was uncomfortable um, because we're going to his home. And so it, was, it felt more of a personal setting because he had been on parole. And when I was in contact with him, his wife kept on saying, oh, that'll be great, come for lunch. You know, and it felt like, I'm not here for the food, lady. You know, this is... So it felt that... And I didn't want to seem rude in case they cancelled and all those things. Um, it was interesting meeting him. I mean, he is a, he's a politician. And, I, and as you were speaking to me, I could imagine him in his prime leader of the CP party, or one of the leaders of the CP party, and getting a crowd going. But um, he gave me a history lesson about why he killed my dad. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't point blank, you know. I, I still don't, I get it, but I still don't get it. It just seemed um, a bit, I don't know, a bit too clean. Yeah. And, um, yeah, so he was, and it just felt there were still many justifications. And meeting his wife, I did not, I did not like the woman. I really didn't. She still gives me the heebie-jeebie. Sometimes I still expect to see her behind me. But, um, so, and, and the thing is now she felt hard done by, you know, that um, it felt like she felt that, our family, the death of this guy that they chose to kill, mm -hmm. you know, was more of a burden and a hardship on her. And I don't think she's ever considered us, mm -hmm. you know. Whereas maybe her husband, because of his time in jail, seemed a little more sincere. Where her, I don't know, actually, she didn't even apologize. No, she didn't. I guess why would she apologize? She was acquitted. But no, she, it, her life was very difficult. She also suffered because of this, which I just did not. I mm -hmm. just, yeah, it didn't feel right to me. Um, yeah. You said to Clive Derby Lewis that by killing Chris Harney, he had given the country Jacob Zuma. How did he respond to this? Um, did I knew someone would ask me that. Um, it, his reaction, you know what, we all laughed. We all laughed. I think it was a way for me to break the ice, you know, because I still don't believe that my father would have been president out of his own choice. So this whole, I was writing off the idea, because I, I, before I asked him, so what do you think about the whole thing that everyone says he would have been president? And you know, and I said, now inadvertently, we have the president that we do that no one likes. Um, he's not very popular with the people. And then we all laughed. And then I remember later on, um, they said, so what are we going to do about Zuma? So I said, this is how the conversation probably started over 20 years ago. What are we going to do about the honey problem? So yeah, I just didn't want to engage him thoroughly. But oh, no, they were very upset with the administration and the treatment and all of those. Yeah. You also met the man who pulled the trigger on your father, Yanis Wallace. In contrast to your meeting with Clive Derby Lewis, you seem more sympathetic to Wallace. Why was that? Because. I got to know him. Um, I've always been very curious about him. And there was just something in his eyes 24 years ago that was just dead. And I wanted to find out who is this man? You know, what, what, what is his motivations? Where does he come from? And all those kind of questions. So I got to, I asked him more about his life than I did with Clive. You know, I don't think I asked Clive anything except that does he have children. Whereas with Yanusha, I went into details about his childhood and all those because I wanted to start from there. I didn't want to. I didn't want to start immediately with the assassination. Yeah. So I started with who, where, how he grew up, what did he do when he was young, and all those kinds of questions. And he was very forthcoming. You know, he's very he's very straightforward, and he doesn't. He's not riddled by emotions. You know, he's quite, so I appreciated that. And it's just, I would say because of the, the NA program, the Narcotics Anonymous program and the AA program I'm on, 
we're always told to look at similarities rather than differences. So this is what this is what I think subconsciously I was doing. Like when he was talking about that the government used to harass his father because he was a businessman in Poland, I could relate to that. I could relate I could relate to to a few things about his life and the fact that he has a daughter and I think the daughter's a year older than me and he has a granddaughter and he taught his daughter how to swim. I just felt there was a connection between us. And maybe because he pulled, he, not maybe, he pulled the trigger. And also maybe because he's the last person who saw my dad alive. Mm -hmm. But I just think that I, I reacted more positively to his forthright nature. He doesn't give excuses. He told me quite almost coldly how he murdered my dad and p with such precision, you know, and and I and I, this is what I wanted to hear. This is what I wanted to hear. And also that for some he told he can distinguish between his his um, remorse for killing my father, but he, he doesn't his little bit lack of remorse for killing an SACP leader. And I can appreciate that because I was there for that reason. I don't know, you know, I am still in therapy about <laughs> these, the way that I feel with, about Janusz Walusz. It's a, it's a conflicting emotions because there's something about him that I do like. How do you deal with your identity today? It is a process. I mean, this is still very new. This is still very new. And um, I've just come to acknowledge and accept that I will always be Chris Honey's daughter. But it just feels that today I'm doing it on my own terms and I'm doing it with my head held high and I don't have the shame about my personal journey anymore. So it, it almost feels like I've been cleansed and that he's lifted me. I feel like he's elevated me into even sharing the same space as him. I feel worthy today of the honey surname, you know? Like now I think that I don't have the shame and burden and put my head down and people are like, that's Chris Honey's daughter. Now I'm like, yes I am, you know? And I'm also trying to find out who Lindue is in the process. So it's a fulfilling journey. That was Lindue Hani discussing her book, Being Chris Hani's Daughter.